Welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We're moving on to Nintendo Power issue number 16 this time, for September of 1980. This is a normal issue of Nintendo Power, so we are going to be going our full length, lot with lots of games to cover this issue, including some expanded Game Boy coverage, so, well, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Maniac Mansion, with a diorama cover, which looks nice. In our letters column, we have another letter from a parent, or in this case a grandparent, who uh, praises the NES and its game library. Uh, we have a continuation of the Final Fantasy Strategy Guide, and again, we're getting a designated strategy guide for the game next issue, so I'm going to hold off on the coverage until then. This guide covers up to getting Adamant from the Sky Castle. Maniac Mansion gets a bunch of useful tips, along with a map of the mansion and a list of characters for the game, as well as a, some walkthroughs for a few party combinations. Maniac Mansion is an interesting adventure game. While the game has a standard environment, so everything is pretty much in the same place every time, it also has some semi-randomized events and some stealth elements as you have to avoid various characters in the mansion while you set about rescuing your captured friend, although getting certain items will allow you to not get captured or what have you at these, at these points. This means in turn that you need to quickly be able to switch between the various kids of your trio while moving throughout the mansion. This leads me to my primary complaint about the game, the interface. The scum interface, which the game uses, is basically designed for a mouse, because it's really designed for PCs, which means it loses something when it's running on a console and is being controlled with a D-pad. To be clear, Maniac Mansion is not a bad game. Far from it. The reputation the game has achieved as a very fun and funny adventure game is completely merited. However, this is just a game that would greatly benefit from being played on the PC instead of on consoles, or alternatively, would have benefited from having come out later on the Super Nintendo after the Super Nintendo mouse had been released with uh, Mario Paint. I'd recommend, honestly, hunting down a copy of the PC version of this game and loading the data files of that out into Scum VM, which is available for free and is open source. Now, if, the version, if this version of the game is all you can find, that's okay. It's in a pinch. There's no other way to experience the game. This is a decent way to go with. It's just, I think the PC version of the game is beyond a doubt a, the better way to go. In Howard and Nestor, this time Nestor is taking on the Moffat Conspiracy. Unfortunately, being this is Nestor we're talking about, he's going to have, he has some difficulty finding his way to his target without the assistance of Howard. In the top 30 of this issue, all three games that have already received, or are about to receive, strategy guide issues are in the top five. Next is Roller Games. This is a roller derby themed beat-em-up developed by Konami and licensed from the nationally syndicated television show. Considering that roller derby wasn't much of a thing in Japan, actually I don't think roller derby's ever been a thing in Japan, this game hasn't received a Japanese release, which is Almost in the kind of a shame, just because I'd love to see Arena play this on Game Center CX. Now, it's important to mention, at the time this game was released, Roller Derby was a scripted form of sports entertainment, like professional wrestling, as opposed to the modern firm, form of Roller Derby, which actually plays it more like an actual sport. The game, well, the guide gives maps for the first two levels, as well as notes for the subsequent stages in the game. Roller Games has some interesting ideas, and it starts to go somewhere with them before hurtling into a rink wall while screaming, Jane, stop this crazy thing! The idea of an action platformer based around characters on roller skates is an interesting one, particularly with all the things that you can do with that with slopes and momentum. Similarly, due to the nature of roller derby in the 90s as a kayfabe combat sport, a roller derby-themed brawler is also a really good idea. The problem is, when you try to combine the two concepts into one game, things start to fall apart. Still, there are some interesting ideas here, and they've resulted in an imperfect, but still enjoyable game. I just wish they'd been executed better. Next is NES Play Action Football, which is covered in the Multi-Tap Strategy Guide issue, which is to come, so I'm going to hold off on the full guide until then. In the classified information section, we have a stage select code for Red Racer 2, 
and notes on how to find the sliding tile puzzle minigame in Final Fantasy. Next is Snake, Rattle, and Roll, a isometric platformer from Rare, which means the camera perspective basically gives the game one strike from the get-go. Going from the guide, it looks like the idea is you have to eat enough with your critter while going through the level to pass the threshold that you have to meet in order to progress, but do it before the time limit runs out. However, this leads to the problem. Snake, Rattle, and Roll is, because it's an isometric, isometric platformer, and because platforming doesn't work that well from that camera perspective, um, this basically doesn't really work well as a game. Don't get me wrong, you can do platforming from a 3D or pseudo 3D perspective. If you couldn't, then we wouldn't have gotten 3D platformers like, like Super Mario 64, or, um, Banjo Kazooie, or Crash Bandicoot, or any of those other games. But in order for platforming to work, in 3D or pseudo 3D, you have to be able to rotate the camera in order to gauge the distance on your jumps. And you just can't do that with the camera perspective in most isometric games, and Snake, Rattle, and Roll is no exception. Give this game a miss. Kickle Cubicle is a puzzle game from Nintendo and Irem that, going from the guide, looks a lot like an ice-themed Adventures of Lolo. The article gives tips for all four of the game's worlds. Garden Land, Fruit Land, Cake Land, and Toy Land. Kickle Cubicle succeeds at doing what NES puzzle games need to be good at, being very simple to learn the basics of, with a steadily increasing degree of complexity as you make your way through the game. The main character, Kickle, has two abilities. He can freeze enemies, including freezing some of the blocks, and he can place ice pillars into the environment which can protect against enemies, and stop blocks from moving further when it kicks them. Blocks that are knocked into water create another space that you can move on. Consequently, in order to collect the items you need to proceed to the next level, you have to freeze enemies into blocks, kick blocks into the right spaces in the water, while also not getting hit by enemies who you can't freeze into blocks, and also keep them from kicking blocks into you and potentially killing you. From there, you get a tremendous degree of interestingly designed puzzles and very gradual but not challenge not too challenging or rather not too easy I should say degree of difficulty and because of this I strongly recommend checking this game out also considering this game was released in Japan in fact it was made for Japan first I'm kind of surprised this game hasn't ended up on game Center CX yet often the show, likes to feature puzzle games because they tend to be a Reno strong suit. In Counselor's Corner, we get a whole bunch of tips for Crystallis and Snake's Revenge and Shadow and uh, Shadowgate and other similar games. I've started noticing a trend here. When a new RPG or adventure game comes out, we get a whole bunch of new questions for those games, particularly since those games involve a lot more exploration and a lot more puzzles than, say, your typical platformer which means that there are a lot more places for players to get lost or confused, and as this is, this is the era before the internet and being able to toss your questions out there in the ether, that option isn't available for most readers. Just to be clear, as someone who grew up during this era, that situation wasn't ideal. I like the fact that we have sites like GameFAQs now. Next up is Mission Impossible. I had thought this game was more stealth-themed from earlier preview articles, but going from the guide, it seems it was wrong. Also, this article has the inexplicable typographical decision to use light blue text on whitish blue. Anyway, between the article itself and the fold-out poster, we have coverage of pretty much all of the game. So, Mission Impossible for the NES is a straight-up action game, which is disappointing, as the Metal Gear games had demonstrated that you could do a stealth adventure game on the NES. This game instead is a top-down action game with some adventure elements, and it basically just doesn't quite work. It doesn't fit with the concept of the series, which is about a team of spies accomplishing missions through subterfuge and cunning over brute force and massive ignorance. It also doesn't really work from a gameplay standpoint, uh, in large part because while certain characters in your team have different abilities, like the ability to pick locks on doors, they're just, it's, it, 
doesn't quite work that well in terms of distinguishing them from each other aside from their attacks. And while I'll give this game credit for having a decent lockpicking minigame before lockpicking minigames were a thing, it's not... nothing is really executed right well. I mean, well, I mean, even aiming in diagonals, which you have to do for these sort of top-down games, doesn't handle very well. It's all, it's all kind of a mess, which is a shame. As much as I want this game to be good and I want to like it, I gotta say it's probably best to give this game a miss. Moving into Game Boy games, we have another Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles platform brawler for the Game Boy with Fall of the Foot Clan. We have maps of the first two stages and notes on stages 3 through 5. Fall of the Foot Clan is basically Kung Fu for the NES, but with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and some platforming elements which makes it not particularly good in terms of being a Turtles game. It's not that the game is bad. The controls are fine. The game doesn't have any logical absurdities like Turtles being unable to swim, like the first NES Turtles game had. It's just... boring. And honestly, being boring is one of the gravest sins a video game can commit. Just skip this game. Moving on, we have a arcade-style action game for for the Game Boy from Atlas called Cosmo Tank, where you fight insects with your battle tank on a variety of alien worlds, and the article has a write-up of the first level. Cosmo Tank is an odd mix of a top-down tank shooter and a first-person on-rails, somewhat on-rails shooting game, and an RPG. You explore various alien worlds and get experience points for, from killing enemies, which will increase your health. The critters also drop special power-ups that level up your gun. Eventually, you have to go into dungeons in the game, which move into the first-person perspective, and which lead to fighting bosses until you fight each planet's world boss, or life core. Once you defeat the life core, you've defeated that world, and you move on to the next one. The problem is, is on the top-down mode, the monsters come in at angles you can't readily shoot at. You can't really move at diagonals, or even for that matter, like, quarter diagonals, or rather, like, eighths of a um, of a uh, circle is the best way to describe it which means that the uh, that you're just kind of going to get clobbered a bunch with a lot of cheap hits that you can't really avoid additionally the only way to dodge shots in the first person section is to have the shot be off camera which also means the enemy that fought, shot at you is off camera which means you can't shoot back at them so, in order to shoot the enemy, to defeat them so you can move on, you have to move the enemy on camera, which means you're getting shot. You can see the problem from here. Frankly, I don't think this is a game that is properly suited for this platform, for, for, game, Boy, for the game Boy. This is a game that probably worked really well on the PC or on a console with two analog sticks that will let you move and shoot in different directions in the top-down mode. Um, and the first-person mode might even work better as a kind of pseudo-first-person shooter when those started being things that existed with Doom. So, in any case, it doesn't work on the Game Boy, and it probably wouldn't work on the NES either, so I recommend giving this game a miss. Next is an article on Quarth, which is a puzzle game from Konami for the Game Boy that is kind of like a mix of Tetris and a top-down shoot-'em-up. Quarth is a shockingly good puzzle game. While it doesn't have a lot in common with Tetris in terms of shooting shapes, it is the closest thing you can think of to a puzzle shoot 'em up. You control a spaceship containing with an ever descending string of shapes, and you have to fire blocks to form the shapes, or combination of shapes, into quadrilaterals, squares, and, tri and uh, rectangles. It controls incredibly well and is a lot of fun to play, and it has a two player mode for System Link, which is also interesting. The game got a Famicom release, which also had a two player mode. So if you have a way to play Famicom games, like for whether you own a converter or you're going to be getting the Retro 5 when that comes out, I really recommend picking up that version of the game as well. Skate or Die is expanded to a narrative-driven action platformer on the Game Boy with the subtitle Bad and Rad. We have a map of the game's first level and notes for the second through fourth levels. 
This game is poorly designed, which is disappointing considering everything I said earlier about skate-themed action platformers when talking about roller games. The movement and jumping controls are generally fine, and the idea of adjusting the gameplay of Skate or Die to downhill slalom and side-scrolling platforming levels for the handheld version of the game is, on paper, a really good idea. In practice, this game runs through some problems. For example, the field of view in this game is just close enough to not give the player enough time to react to some of the jumps. Additionally, the game has the bright idea of adding enemies to the game, who you can't take out, as opposed to roller games earlier this issue, which means that you take a lot of cheap damage, which also kills your momentum. And this is a big deal, as with any game like this, momentum is king. Also, the game likes to throw instant depth obstacles like spikes or bottomless pits at you, which, combined with the limited number of lives, and the field of view problems, and the enemies killing your momentum, makes this game just frustrating enough to not make it worth a recommendation. Now, that said, this is the kind of thing where a second game with some polish would fix these problems and probably be good, but I don't think we got a second game with this playstyle. On the Game Boy Previews column which comes after this. We have a look at Activision's boxing game for the Game Boy, appropriately titled Heavyweight Championship Boxing, along with Asimix's puzzle game Catch Rap and Nintendo's Balloon Fight spin-off Balloon Kid. In the NES Previews column, we have a look at Little Nemo from Capcom, one of the few licensed games which eclipses its source material, as opposed to just being equal to it. There's also a rundown of each of your companion critters from the game, who will help you on your way. There's also a look at Dragon Warrior 2, which now gives the player a party of adventurers, as opposed to just one character, and a much larger world to explore. Also of note is Solar Jetman, and we get a map of the game's first level. There's also a brief look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, a home port of the arcade game, though sadly without multi-tap support to make it four-player, like the arcade version. Come to think about it, have we gotten the four-player Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles brawler before the current-ish console generation, by, by which I mean Xbox 360, uh, in that era? Because we didn't get any during the NES era. We didn't get any during the Super Nintendo era. And by the time the PlayStation era came around, PS1 era, the... Uh, Turtles had kind of been on the decline, and we weren't really getting any Turtles games at all during that era. We got a few during the PS2 era, PS2, Xbox era, but of the consoles that were out then, I think well, GameCube and Xbox supported four-player out of the gate, whereas PS2 needed a multi-tap. But PS2 was the biggest, had the biggest install base. So most people would probably been designing with that in mind. So, like, only recently can we really go, oh, we have consoles which are capable of supporting four controllers or more out of the gate. So, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, so let, let's move on. In the new game section, we ha we get coverage of Gauntlet 2, which is being ported by Mindscape, since after the whole Tetris fiasco, Atari and Nintendo are no longer on speaking terms. It also has four-player support, so it'll be getting covered in the multi-tap issue. There's also the Dick Tracy game based on the film, which the angry video game nerd has discussed moderately recently. And more information on Swords and Serpents, which, again, we'll be talking about in the multi-tap guide issue. In video shorts, we have a look at the strategy game Shingen the Ruler, which is set during Japan's Sengoku period, and, like Nobunaga's Ambition, features the name of a major daimyo from that period who didn't make it to the Shogunate. You know, I'd almost ask why there aren't any games set in the Sengoku period that are named after Aesu Tokugawa, but then I remember that the reason he managed to become Shogun was because Nobunaga, who Tokugawa was lieutenant to, took out all the major opposition before Akechi Mitsuhide, another of Nobunaga's lieutenants, betrayed Nobunaga in the attack on Honoji Temple. If Mitsuhide, had, Mitsuhide hadn't betrayed Nobunaga, 
or if you had betrayed Nobunaga and failed, that's very likely that if we were talking about the history of Japan, you'd be referring to the Nobunaga Shogunate. And enough of that tangent, let's talk about something completely different, the new console generation. By which I mean in the NES Journal, we're talking about the release of the Super Famicom. Which means, in turn, I get to review Super Nintendo games soon. Yay! Also, our celeb profile column is back, but it's with someone who I've already discussed at great length previously, Will Whedon, so I can kind of just skip over that. Other than that, the NES Journal column gives us some info on the Super Mario Bros. 3 and Maniac Mansion animated series. I should probably at some point, like, watch some of these shows and then do reviews of them, but most of them look so bad that I really don't want to, so I'm probably not going to. Anyway, moving swiftly on, in Pack Watch, we get coverage on an app for the NES that I definitely won't be reviewing because I won't really be able to review it properly. Specifically, the Miracle Piano Teaching System, which is a basically device for your NES that you hook up a keyboard to it and then in turn the software on the game pack will let you will let the NES read the inputs from the piano and help you learn how to play the piano better. It's kind of like a well very early precursor to Rocksmith, with the difference being that I think for the Miracle Piano teaching system you had to use their piano. Um you couldn't use like any other keyboard that had a um, MIDI out, as opposed to Rocksmith, where it pretty much works with any guitar. Electric, electric guitar, that is. Don't, don't know about acoustic. Um, what I might end up reviewing, though, that makes it in the magazine, is the NES port of Ultima 4 and the role-playing game The Adventures of Robin Hood. Since I've got both Game Boy and NES games covered, I'll be giving picks from both systems. For the NES, I'm making Kickle Cubicle my pick, and Quarth is my pick for the Game Boy. Both games are really solid puzzle games, and are both are definitely a lot of fun. Next time, we are getting, at long last, to the strategy guide issue for Final Fantasy 1 for the NES. Goodness knows we've been kind of building up to this for several episodes now, so it's, might as well finally just get down and just deal with it. So, thank you for watching. If you enjoy the show, please feel free to support the show via Patreon. There's a link to my Patreon page in the show notes. Your pledges will help me do shows more frequently, and hopefully will let me upgrade my equipment to something other than the webcam I'm currently using right now. So, again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>